welcome to Diecast Restos and to this really rather beaten up Siku Porsche 914. This has certainly seen better days. It's missing its A pillars, the axles are badly bent, the doors are totally misaligned and its paint and bodywork are in a poor state. What's more, this ADAC version had a white plastic aerial and plastic flag mounted to the roof. Most of those have long since gone. To give you a better idea of how it should look, here's a mint matching example. The decals and wheel trims are just a couple of the variations this casting can have. From what I can gather, CQ produced their 914 throughout the 1970s. The earliest and latest production dates that I could find were 1970 and 1980 respectively. The 914 was originally given a reference of V312, but later adopted the code 1023 in line with other Siku models of the era. I believe all castings were painted yellow, varying from mid shades to orange. Windows can be clear on earlier examples, but green and yellow tints were later available. Wheels also varied. The oldest models had untrimmed black five spoke wheels. Subsequent cars had trim printed onto them in either a five or multi spoke design. These could have the word Siku printed onto the wall of the tyre. The 914 came as either a civilian version or in an ADAC livery like mine. These benefited from the addition of the white plastic aerial and red plastic flag that I mentioned earlier, plus had the corresponding ADAC tampos. Again, these had variations during their production span. The oldest prints had a black R printed onto a white circular background. The front and rear tampos later changed to a black circle with a cutout R. The door symbols remained black on white, though these later changed to a black R with a thin black halo surrounding it, as mine was. If you know of any variations on Siku's 914, do let us know by leaving a comment. The 914 was born in 1969 from a partnership between Porsche and Volkswagen. At the time, Porsche needed an entry level model to replace the outgoing 912 and Volkswagen wanted a sporty car to succeed the Kármán gear. The result was a mid-engined roadster, a rarity for production cars of the late 60s. This placed the engine between the driver and the rear axle, giving it incredible handling characteristics. This car was designed to corner and corner well. The 914 featured a target top, lightweight design and a funky wedge shaped body. However, things start to get a little controversial as we move on to the power plant. It was available with two types of engine. The entry level model came with a 1.7 litre flat 4 sourced from Volkswagen, putting out around 80 horsepower. On the other hand, Porsche purists could opt for the 914.6, which is what this model claims to be based on. This came with a 2 litre flat 6 from the Porsche 911, offering a bit more grunt at 110 horsepower. The 914.6, while pricier, delivered Porsche grade performance, but the 4 cylinder model became the more popular choice due to its affordability. On launch though, it was met with a mixed reaction. It was praised for its handling, unique styling and its lower cost but some questioned whether it was truly a Porsche due to its VW underpinnings. But while the 914 wasn't as fast as a 911, it did offer something else, fun, practicality and ease of maintenance. The 914 garnered its own fan base as a result. It was more approachable than other Porsches. It gave younger enthusiasts a chance to get behind the wheel of something with real sports car DNA. Despite the varied reception on the road, the 914 had a surprising impact on the track. The 914.6 specifically saw success in racing, including taking class victory at the 1970 24 hours of Le Mans. Its balanced weight distribution and nimble handling made it a competitive choice in motorsports. On a related note, it is also notable as being Formula 1's first safety car when it was deployed at the 1973 Canadian Grand Prix. The 914 was produced until 1976, with over 118,000 units sold in 7 years of manufacture. 
While it may not have had the prestige of the 911, it did manage to carve out its own place in Porsche history. Its replacement was the Porsche 924, which I cover in my Majorette model restoration video from 2023. Today, the 914 has become a cult classic. Enthusiasts, including Magnus Walker, appreciate this misunderstood underdog's distinctive design, its raw driving experience and its relative rarity in the modern collector's market. There's no denying that this car is an important part of Porsche's history. Now then, back to the build and I wanted to talk through creating your own decals, which I will do shortly. I've been asked on several occasions to run through how I make my custom decals for diecasts. A lot of the process is sizing up against the model, so there's a load of trial and error and test printing to be done. I don't do anything fancy or use any expensive equipment, just my inkjet printer and literally the cheapest A4 sized water slide decal paper I could find on eBay. I needed the clear backed rather than the white backed decal paper for this project. So against a yellow background, I've mostly used text to recreate Siku's tampograph prints. The front and rear R's are in the naval font with a black background that I'll cut around myself. The Rempelet side text is Platinum R and ADAC is Startliches. As I say, it's all trial and error. All you need to do is size up test prints on plain paper against the casting. The decal paper itself will have recommendations on how to go about setting the prints, but I usually go for two coats of clear gloss 15 minutes apart. You'll then need to carefully cut out each decal and position them accordingly. When applying your decals, make sure that you have a supply of lukewarm water, a cotton bud and ideally plastic tweezers, not metal like mine. I really should practice what I preach. While your decal is soaking in the water bath, you need to wet the area where it is to be affixed. Do this with your cotton bud and then make sure your decal has loosened from the backing paper with a bit of persuasion. Don't leave it too long in the water. You don't want it separating and floating away. It's a total nightmare trying to rescue one in that situation. The beauty of printing your own decals is that if that scenario happens to you, you can at least reprint a new set at your leisure. I always double up on my decals and print two sets just in case. When your decal is in the right position, you should roll out the excess moisture with the dry end of a cotton bud. Allow some time to pass before using a decal setting solution like Mr. Mark Softer. It's brilliant and really helps them look their best. I've even reproduced the wheel trims, which I borrowed a spare set from my Siku Golf Cabrio build. Once all bodywork decals have set and no more trim is required, these decals can be locked in with a clear coat. Meanwhile, for my build, my model needs a new aerial and, more challengingly, a new red flag. I marry up a triangular cut of styrene sheet with a thin styrene rod. I've then joined these to the remnants of the old flag where it connected to the roof of the Porsche. With that glue dry, I primer my new flag. Once I'm happy with how it looks, I give it a coat of red paint. When the flags had a couple of coats of paint, I've reacquainted it with the body. I'm really pleased with how that quick fix has turned out. But now, let's put it back together again. Joining the flag is the simple aerial that I've cut to size using the same styrene rod as the flagpole. The window piece has grooves or cuts in it to accommodate their roots. After a bit of gentle persuasion, it's time to fit the doors. These connect in a square cast slot behind the front wheel arches. With those attached, the simple dashboard components fit in over the two cast in posts. Then it's the interior plastic which also forms part of the front and rear trim as well as grills at the top of the engine cover. Lastly, the base clicks over those tiny rivet posts. So this was how my Siku Porsche 914-6 looked. It was in a very poor condition. 
It lacked its A-pillar on both sides, the rooftop flag was reduced to a stump, the aerial was almost completely absent, and the bodywork had seen better days. This one proved to be quite a challenge. I had to reproduce the decals as accurately as I could, which I ran through for you earlier. But this is the result. I've strived to match the decals design on this project and I am very happy with how they've turned out. The entire body in general has hugely benefited from a rework, most of all those A-pillars. It's always a tricky fix and rarely are the results perfect, but it gives a broken model a new lease of life. Up top sits my flag fix and my basic aerial solution, while down low I've made use of my caution with decals and used a spare set of wheel prints I'd designed for another Siku restoration. Another lowdown feature is the base plate, which shines brightly once more after a good polishing. I'm not a massive fan of the luminous green windows on this, but that's looking better after a polish too. Let me know what you think of it in the comments, and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you again for the next one. Bye for now.